If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 10. Revelation 10. Today I'd like to talk to you about an angel and a scroll. An angel and a scroll. If you have an outline in your bulletin, would you follow along with me? Number one, an unusual angel. There's uh, all kinds of angels in Revelation. Matter of fact, the word angel is used 60 times in Revelation. And uh, three times in Revelation, it speaks of a mighty angel. Number two, an unusual announcement. Unusual announcement. And number three, an unusual assignment. An unusual assignment. And uh, we thank God for Revelation. A question that has troubled God's people throughout history is why God has allowed evil in this world. The wicked seem to prosper, sin seems to run wild, and Christians tend to suffer much heartache. Another question is, why doesn't God stop all this sin and pain and sorrow and chaos in our world? My friend, there is a day coming when God will break his silence, and the purpose of God for mankind will all make sense. At that time, we as Christians will be raptured out of this world. We will be with God and God and Jesus in heaven, waiting to come back with him, to destroy all evil and to live with him forever and ever. Our text today is an interlude or a pause between the sixth and seventh trumpets. By the way, there's three pauses in the book of Revelation. Uh, These interludes remind us that God is in control of all life events and everything will work out for our good and for his glory. They are also meant to encourage the Christian when going through challenging times. So let's look at an angel and a scroll. Revelation chapter 10. The Bible says, and I saw. John has said this many times. And when you see, I saw, it begins a new vision a new vision, another mighty angel coming down from heaven. And when you see the word another, and folks, this is why I say every word in the word of God is important. Every word. So he sees another, which means it's not like the other mighty angels. And the Bible says coming down from heaven. And, uh, you know, scholars Uh, have an idea of possibly who this is, but like a lot of revelation, uh, it is not clear-cut on who it is. Uh, One of the, uh, you know, opinions is it was Gabriel, the messenger. Others thought it was Jesus Christ himself. But, and I agree, uh, some of the descriptions is the same here as before, But because of the actions of this angel, I I am without a doubt, I do do not think it is Jesus Christ. And I'll share that with you here in just a few verses. But here's my opinion. I think it's the angel Michael. And the reason I say Michael is, number one, he was the archangel. Number two, he does battle with Satan. So we're talking about the highest-ranking angel And the reason I say that is the description that follows, okay? Look at this description. And again, he came out of heaven, clothed with a cloud. And I understand this is one of the main reasons people thought it might have been Jesus Christ, okay? Because he will be coming back in a cloud. But a cloud also, it it represents two things, the presence of God, the presence of God in the Holy of the Holies, All right, when the Israelites uh, were making their journeys, it was fire by night and it was a cloud by day. But a cloud also senses judgment. It can mean judgment. And that's what I think this cloud means. And it says, and a rainbow was was on his head. There was a rainbow around the throne, but not on Jesus's head. And we know the rainbow speaks of promises. But not only the promises, what happened before that promise? God destroyed mankind. And it says, and his face was like the sun. 
Again, Moses, when he had done business with God and took the Ten Commandments, when he come down, his face was radiant as the sun. And, and the Shekinah glory of God is what it's talking about. And if anybody is close to the throne or around the throne and around God and Jesus, it would be the angel Michael. So that's why I believe that in his feet like pillars of fire, and I believe he is speaking of judgment there. And when you say judgment, I am talking about the seven of bowls that are yet to come. The seventh trumpet is the seventh bowls, and I wanted to remind you of that. And he had a little book open in his hand. And again, there are people that think this book is the same as the book in chapter 5. But there's several things uh, different about this book. Number one, it's little. Okay, we're not talking about a big book. We're talking about a little book. It is small. And when you think of the book in, in chapter 5, Jesus was the only one that could open the seals then. So it would not be that, the same book there. And the other thing, the book is open, which it was closed and it was sealed also. Only Jesus could take that. So we are looking at a totally different book. The Bible says, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And again, Michael, uh, being an angel and uh, you know, being what I think is the messenger of God, can, can be that messenger. He can put one foot on the sea. And basically that means God is in control of the land and the sea. The land and the sea. And it says, and he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And there's no doubt, uh, you know, when, when, you know, angels and messengers, it is even uh, uh, described as thunder at times. So this was a very important message in this interlude. God was giving uh, John, and God was also, I believe, speaking to the Christians that were still alive, or even those uh, that had already been persecuted. Then, verse, then the rest of that, and when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. In the seven thunders, there's opinions there also. Some think it's the seven, uh, you know, uh, bowl seals that are coming, but it really doesn't... I, I don't think we can clearly say that's what that is. I, I, would, I, I would guess that is a possibility. But with what he says later on, folks, you must understand this. There's some things in life we'll never know. I mean, and we can't figure everything else, and we sure can't figure God out. Okay, God is God. He rules the world. He doesn't need your permission to do anything. Let me put it that way. All right? And there's times that we give him our opinion, and I know what God does. He just shakes his head. Folks, there are some things in Revelation that are hard to explain. So while this is not clear-cut, it could be the seven uh, bold judgments. Verse 4, And when the seven thunders uttered their voices... I was about to write, and it says, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, the angels come down, John is the one recording them, seal up the things which the seven thunders utter and do not write them. So what is he saying? These booming voices, this booming voice comes from heaven. And folks, I believe it was God. And you know what God does sometimes? God tells us to wait. And do you know one of the hardest things we do in life? Of the nine fruits of the Spirit, I guarantee you, 100%, the last one we master is patience. Amen. We don't want to wait on God. We don't want to wait on people. We don't want to wait in lines. We don't want to wait for someone to call us back. 
We don't want to, and you just fill in the blank. But folks, there's time that God puts pauses in for reasons and purposes. Isaiah 40. Go with me to Isaiah 40. You know this text, but I think it, it describes exactly what I am speaking of and the example I want you to understand on this pause. Verse 28, have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. He doesn't, he's not like us, folks. He's a spirit. He is God. We get tired. We get fatigued. We get worn out. And do you realize that when we are that way, we are most susceptible to spiritual warfare? Satan doesn't play fair. And sometimes life is rough. It's rough, but God is with us. Neither faints or his understanding is unsearchable. You can try and try and try, but you cannot put God in a box. God created everything that you see. God has a purpose in everything that he does. God knows better than you even God's will for your life. He knows, and it says, and he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Why would he put that in there? Because the youth lack experience. A senior adults, we've been there. We've done that. We've seen it when God says, wait. We don't like it, but we have learned over the years if God says wait, we need to wait. We need to obey God. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. Folks, waiting shows a trust in God. Waiting shows that you believe in God and what He is doing. Waiting sometimes, even though we don't like it, God will reveal his plan in time, on time. Folks, God is never wrong. His timing is always right. Jesus himself waited, what, four days before he went to Lazarus. Why did he wait? Mary and Martha couldn't figure it out. Both of them said, Jesus, if you would have been here, our brother would live. But Jesus knew that the greatest miracle... Uh, in the Bible, or one of the greatest miracles of the Bible, was going to happen. Instead of him healing a sick man, he raised a dead man from the grave. So good comes out of waiting. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Oh, folks, we have our renewed strength in God. We have re renewed strength in Jesus Christ. Do you not think Jesus Christ was weary at times? Why do you think he went to the mountain to pray? Why do you think he rested? Why did God create things in six days and said the seventh day is the day of rest? Because waiting can be good. And they shall mount up with wings like eagles. And you know, the deals with eagles, folks, is they fly, fly high. They can easily fly over the storms in life. And they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, oh, folks, this was an unusual angel. It was an unusual description of an angel. And we see here that he, John was going to uh, write these things down, and God said, no, wait. Do not write them down. And folks, pauses gives God and the Holy Spirit time to work. Time to work. And we need to understand that pauses are not always negative. They are not negative, and it's so important uh, that we understand this. Number two, not only is there's an unusual angel, there's an unusual announcement. Look at verse five. And the angel whom I saw 
standing on the sea and on the, hand, on the land, raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. And here is one of the reasons I say it wasn't Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't have to swear to anything. He was God. He was God in human flesh down here. And so there's, there's no reason for Jesus to do this and this action to take place. But I believe, again, it was a mighty angel, and in my opinion, it was Michael. And he raised his hand. Why do, why do we raise our hands in a court of law? What do they say? You promise or do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. You know what truth is, folks? Truth is Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is the word of God. The Bible says it is yes, and it is amen. It says the word of God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. This new generation want to say, hey, the Old Testament doesn't apply anymore. Oh, folks, somebody needs to wake up. Somebody needs to realize that the Old Testament and, and the experiences there teach us, and we can learn from those experiences. I believe the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation chapter 22. It is real. It is God. It is truth who created the heavens and the things that are in it, and the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it. What is he saying? Folks, we're talking about God here. We're talking about God who spoke the world into existence. There, there are all kinds of theories out there, but I'm telling you, you know, the Bang Theory, you know, <laughs> The Big Bang Theory, out there were planets and they were all buzzing around the universe and two of them crashed. Boom! Hey! All at once, Earth appeared. Others, all right, there was a tadpole and it turned into a frog. It come out of the water and somehow it became mankind. Come on, folks. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Amen. We weren't here by accident. He created you. Matter of fact, he said you were wonderfully created by God. And he gave man a purpose. He gave man a heart. He gave man a mind so that you could think and that you could make decisions. And so he is saying, listen, God's got this. The very person that created this can take care of this. That it, that it there should be no delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. And what is he saying? He's saying you have to look in times past to see. And who is he talking about the prophets? He's talking about the Old Testament prophets. And here's how I know that the Word of God is truth. These things that were written in the Old Testament are coming for real, coming alive in the New Testament. Much of what I have said, and that's why I've been going back and forth from the Old Testament to the New Testament, because even before, people like Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel, Ezekiel and Zechariah and Joel, these are direct quotes from these Old Testament prophets that had to believe in a coming Messiah and that one day Jesus would come back and he did create a place in heaven. And that's what he is saying. He's saying there are some things that are just mysterious. And to some people, the gospel is a mystery. The gospel is a mystery. They don't understand all that is in the gospel. There's two questions that we ask all the time. Why? Why? Why is there such evil 
in the world? Why does my child, why does my baby have to die? Why did my mom get cancer? How? How are these things working? How are these things happening? And folks, God knows. And I believe with all my heart, when you get to heaven, those questions are not going to matter. Because you will be in the Shekinah glory of God. You will be with God. You will be with God. And you just take the example of a baby dying, folks. I am telling you, you will see that child again according to Scripture. You will see the, that child in their perfect state. And so there are some things in life that are a mystery and some things that we just don't understand. And he told his prophets in days of old, and the prophets said, thus saith the Lord. And I'm sure even in that day, there were people that looked at him saying, what is he talking about? What is this prophet talking about a coming Messiah? What is this thing called heaven? What is this thing, uh, uh, the tribulation and all these things? But God revealed them. God, in his foreknowledge, Use these prophets to touch people's lives. And the neat thing about us in the day that we are living, I am telling you, Jesus did live. Jesus did live a perfect life. He was born of a virgin. And I know people have a problem with that. But folks, God can do anything he wants to do. If Joseph was the biological father, Jesus would not be the perfect son of God. He would be just like you and me. And I got news for you. He ain't like us. He's perfect. We're not even close. So the mysteries, there are all kinds of mysteries that you may not know. You may not understand. Listen to me. God has a purpose and a reason for everything in life. Turn to Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. The Apostle Paul speaks of this. Romans 16. Verse 25, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel. There are people that, I, I know this is hard to believe, that literally don't know who Jesus is. They live in America. They live sometimes in the Bible Belt, and they don't even know who Jesus is. Nobody has ever shared the gospel with them. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. It wasn't like God was playing hide and seek with you. It was just the communication and all that in biblical times was nothing like it is today. You can get on your phone right now if you want to, and I don't know how to do all them buttons and thing on there, but you can talk to someone over in Japan. You could, you could walk out there and, and just... What is, what is it called when somebody's face is on there? What's that called? FaceTime. Okay, that's what it's called. Anybody, you can do FaceTime in seconds, literally in seconds. That wasn't the way it was in biblical days. When I think of the Apostle Paul and what he covered in three missionary journeys, my head just spins. He walked a lot of the places he went. So there's going to be a lot of things in life we don't understand. Of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now is manifest. What does manifest mean? Open. It is open. It is an open book. God is an open book. You can read it. Most of us have five, six, seven, eight Bibles. All right? We can get on TV and find the gospel. We can get on, you know, anything, the radio, any form of cum communication and find the gospel. And by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God. Oh, listen, folks. God is not hiding from anyone. We have the gospel now more in more ways than ever in the history of mankind. And it says, for obedience to the faith, to God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Listen to me, folks. The absolute most important thing 
in life is the gospel. It is Jesus Christ. It is His life. It is His birth. It is Him dying on the cross. It is Him being raised to the newness of life on the third day. It is Him uh, at the right hand of God, waiting for God to look over to Him and say, go get my bride. Today's the day of salvation. Uh, Folks, I can't wait for that day. Do you realize that somebody could get saved in this service? And they could walk down the aisle, and the minute they finish praying that prayer and says amen, we're out of here. We're gone. And I'm not saying it would happen, all right? But it's going to happen somewhere, folks. Somebody is going to get saved. And folks, that is the gospel. And folks, I realize it's a mystery to some people because some people don't want to believe the gospel, all right? And I know a lot of it is how we were raised, how we were raised. But there's something about the Holy Spirit that plants a seed in your mind and your heart saying, Man, you need to be saved. You need to invite Jesus into your life. I tell you the truth, and I testify today, the greatest thing that happened in my life was the day I was saved. I was 22 years old. It was August the 23rd, 1980. I had been a church member. I had been previously baptized, but I knew I wasn't saved. And you talk about relief. You talking about joy. You talk about the angels in heaven rejoicing. Folks, the gospel is the... You know what? Gospel literally means good news. Good news. So we see an unusual angel, an unusual announcement, and an unusual assignment. Look back in our text. The unusual assignment is, Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, who stands on the sea and the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me this little book. Can you imagine what John was thinking? (laughs) Looking up at the angel. knowing it. I mean, he may not have known it was Michael, but I mean, just looking up and saying, he didn't ask. He was following orders. Give me that book. All right? Most of us would correct our children for that. I hope so. And he said to me, Take and eat it. (laughs) What? Take and eat it. Folks, God gives some things and and makes statements. We're just thinking, what are you talking about? You sure about that? God, can we talk a little bit? Folks, you you negotiate with people every day of your life. You cannot negotiate with God. It is yes, it is amen, it is truth. Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter but it will be as sweet as honey to your mouth. What? What? If you eat a book, I don't even think it's going to taste good. All right? But this is a special book. A special book. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and I ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. Again, honey, hot yeast rolls butter in the middle, honey on top. I just died and went to heaven. (laughs) Don't you love to smell them cooking? But this book, this reaction was totally different. Once it got to the stomach, it was bitter. It was bitter. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. What is he saying? Folks, do you realize the gospel is not sweet to everyone? It's not. You can witness to someone, and I've done it before, and they were just like, they just get upset with you. They just get mad about it. It was sweet to you because you have experienced that, but it challenged other people. And I am talking about people that know, don't know Jesus Christ. To a Christian, the gospel is sweet as honey. And this is the encouragement, folks. Not only this is what 
kills me. I mean, we, we tend to complain to God quite a bit, but not just think about what is in front of us. What's in front of us? Folks, the best is yet to come. We get church in heaven too. We get the promises, the assurance of salvation in heaven too. It was like the guy that got buried in, in the casket when they went by. He had a fork in his hand. And everybody's going, what in the world? And here we go again. Dessert. German chocolate cake. Folks, the best is yet to come. It is like honey in the mouth of a Christian. But to someone who doesn't know Christ, I am telling you, it will be, I'm telling you, when he comes and you don't know Christ, it'll be the worst day of your life. The worst day. And he said, you must prophesy again and about many peoples. What was John doing? Think about what he told him to begin with. Write these things down. John was on the island of Patmos. And he was exiled for being a believer. He was exiled for preaching the gospel. But yet, his name, who he was, and his work will remain forever. Why? Because he penned the book of Revelation by the Holy Spirit, exactly what God told him to write. So he's saying, you must preach to others. Folks, I am telling you, John is still preaching. Everyone that teaches the book of, of Revelation, everyone that looks at the book of John, I am telling you, he is still speaking. 2 Corinthians 2. 2 Corinthians 2. Go with me. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Folks, we're overcomers. There's victory in Jesus. And through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. He's be, what is he talking about? That fragrance, that sweet aroma, that, that you know, uh, again, our senses smell great and beautiful things. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved. And even when our prayers are heard, that fragrance, that aroma goes up to heaven. And when we think about being saved and when we share the gospel of Jesus Christ and when we help others in the name of Jesus, there's that aroma, there's that fragrance that it just it smells great in the nostrils of God. And among those who are perishing, to the ones... We are aroma of death leading to death. What is he talking about? He's talking about the lost. The lost. And folks, we know what a dead person smells like or something dead. It's awful. It's awful. And folks, I am telling you, spending an eternity away from Christ and God in heaven is awful. It's what he's saying. And to the other, aroma, uh, an aroma of uh, of life leading to life. So there's only two choices, life or death. Life or death. Jesus or this world. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. Hey, as a minister of the gospel, I don't want to be called a, a peddler. You believe everything the Bible says? I sure do. Do you believe it is truth? Do you really believe it is God-inspired and truth? Yes, I do. I'm not peddling the gospel, folks. I'm telling people about Jesus Christ. I'm telling you how you can be saved, how Christ can come into your life and change your life. We're not on, you know, we're not on TV selling Bibles. And I get tired of this salesmanship. If you sin... A hundred or five hundred dollars in, I'll give you this blessing cloth. Folks, that's not what it's about. It's about salvation. The gospel is free, but it costs God his 
only begotten Son, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God and in Jesus Christ. Folks, it's all about Jesus. Man, it's all about we. We're not peddling anything. We're telling you what the Word of God says, how you can have everlasting life. Romans 1, last two scriptures, Romans 1, Romans 1, verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed that you're a Christian? Well, shame on you is all I can say. I am not ashamed. Folks, I'll shout it from the rooftops. I am saved. I am a believer. I will take life. And if you want to take my life because I am a believer, then so be it. So be it. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Folks, you know why the church exists? To lead people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. First, uh, to the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Folks, you have to have faith. And faith isn't that hard, folks. It's believing in God. Even though you can't see him, you see him working. You see him working. That is is written, the just shall live by faith. And then... Romans 10, Romans 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. People are afraid to share the gospel. But folks, I am telling you, it is so simple. Do you know what I still use more than anything, Scott? The Roman road. Do you know what I like to do? I like them to read the Roman road. I like them to read it out loud. Then you ask, what does that mean to you? And then if they're not getting the right answer, you help them with that. Folks, the Word of God saves people. It's the Word of God. Two things it takes to be saved. The Word of God and the Spirit of God. And when you're reading the Word of God, I promise you the Spirit of God is coming. It's coming next. So why, why did he pause here? He paused for the Christian, saying, I know all these terrible things are happening. It's awful. It's going to be terrible, all these things, all these bold judgments. And the, the last ones, the bold ones, they're worse than any of the other ones. So we're going to pause and tell you why this is important. Yes, revelation is important. Yes, understanding is important. But the gospel of Jesus Christ and your assurance of salvation is more important. It's the gospel. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you. That God, you you have scriptures that are difficult to understand. But God, in the grand scheme of things, they're really not hard to understand. The gospel is the truth. Everyone needs Jesus Christ. Everyone has to make a choice for themselves. Not everyone's going to be saved. Our job is not to save people. I have never saved a person in my life. Only Jesus can save. My job is to share the gospel with others. So God, I pray this would challenge our hearts and challenge our soul. God, it's the truth. It is the yes. It is the amen. So God, I pray that we as Christians would be looking for people to share the gospel with. And God, I pray also for those Christians who need to dedicate their life to Christ. They're not as close to you as they once were. And God, I pray, Lord, that you through the Holy Spirit would just prick their hearts, Lord, and just make them uncomfortable today. And God, I pray that they would respond to you. Maybe somebody needs to come for baptism or even move their membership. God, this is your invitation. This is your time. So God, I pray you do with it what you choose. This is your church. This is your invitation. And God, we give it to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?